So I hope you can really appreciate, you know, how cool the presentations have been so far. And this is what to expect over the next few days. Now, in neonatology, when you have a sentence, when you have newborn or neonate and cool, you cannot but really think of one particular person who has done a lot of work on uh, neonatal uh, encephalopathy. So it is one, our next presenter, so I'm very uh, pleased to be inviting Professor Dennis Anopardi to come and talk to us. Now, Professor Asopardi is a professor of neonatal medicine at the Imperial College uh, London and a consultant neonatologist in both Queen Charlotte and Chelsea Hospital. He has been the leading UK researcher into uh, whole body cooling to prevent neonatal, to prevent, well, to decrease the sequela of neonatal encephalopathy in the term and near uh, term infants, part of the Toby trial. And he is very keenly interested into neuroprotection strategies, including body cooling. So it's my pleasure to invite you know, Professor Azopardi to talk to us about neuroprotection strategies. Good morning and thank you very much for the very kind words and um, for the honor for inviting me to this uh, fantastic meeting. Um, it's a real privilege actually to be here and to learn from some of the giants of neonatology that were mentioned this morning, actually to see them speak. And I've probably learned more than I'm going to teach um, this morning. I'm not actually going to talk about cooling. There was a workshop yesterday about cooling. We spent a lot of time discussing cooling um, yesterday. And I'm sure you've read lots and lots about hypothermia. It is a major advance in the care for babies with asphyxia and encephalopathy. But it is not by any means a silver bullet. It is not by any means a, a, a treatment that we would call um, sufficiently effective. We need to remember that the chances of death or severe disability in survivors in babies who meet the protocol criteria for treatment with cooling is still over 40%. So there is an urgent need for additional therapies or attempts to try and improve the outcome for these babies. And what I've been asked to do today in a very uh, brief period of time is to think about what are our strategies for improving the outcome um, for, for these babies. And um, clearly, the most effective strategies are those that, do, that are social um, and it are really related about improving the care for um, uh, pregnant, uh, pregnancy um, in places where there are um, poor um, uh, obstetric services. Because by far the largest cause of neonatal mortality is due to poor obstetric services available um, in, in um, resource poor countries. But even in resource rich countries, between one and two per thousand births suffer from asphyxial encephalopathy. Um, that figure is quite consistent and quite reliable now in several um, um, uh, studies, including population studies and does not appear to have changed very much in the last 10 to 20 years. In those studies where there's been systematic analysis of the causes for um, uh, babies dying from asphyxia encephalopathy, it is interesting that about, in about 50% of cases, avoidable factors are identified. So clearly, our best way for improving that or, or improving the outcomes for these babies is actually to improve our prenatal and perinatal care. And once the baby is born and suffering from asphyxia encephalopathy, our opportunity for improving outcome becomes limited. But this is um, going to be the focus for my talk. So when trying to understand how we might intervene once a baby is born and has, is suffering from asphyxia encephalopathy, it is important to, to think about the pathophysiological processes that might be involved. And, um, and these processes, as you can see, are likely to occur over a long period of time. So it's not just a question of resuscitating baby and giving therapy in the first few um, hours after birth. One needs to think about the processes that are going on well before birth. And these include um, factors that are beyond our control at the moment, in the sense that there may well be genetic um, um, factors that influence the, res the response of the fetus to asphyxia. We know that maturity has a profound effect into the way, um, the type of injury that happens after an asphyxial insult. 
with white matter injury predominating in the less mature infants. And gender also seems to have um, quite a significant effect um, with um, differences in outcome and also probably differences in response to neuroprotective therapies. Again, before birth, there are also likely to be events which might well influence whether the baby becomes sensitized to hypoxia ischemia, um, uh, for example, by the occurrence of inflammation and infection antenatally, or becomes, uh, develops tolerance by pre-exposure, um, sublethal um, or sub-injurious um, doses of uh, asphyxia or hypoxia. So these are largely outside our control, but may well have a very um, profound or important effect on whether uh, a, baby, a newborn baby will suffer from asphyxia and what the consequences of that asphyxia will be. And then we come to the primary insult, the asphyxia injury itself. And in about 20% of cases, this is um, clearly defined by sentinel event, such as a uterine rupture or an abruption, uh, for example. But in the majority of cases, in many, in, in, um, at the time, the insult, the injury, goes unrecognized. And at the moment, we have very poor technology for identifying babies who are um, suffering from asphyxia, from hypoxia ischemia. Um, the cardiotocogram is a very ineffective, uh, inefficient way for identifying these babies. And we need a lot of research for improving our ability to identify babies at risk during uh, peripartum. Once the baby is born, there's then a process of secondary injury, which lasts, in the initial phase at least, at least uh, last uh, at least 72 to 96 hours. Uh, but probably some, um, some pathological processes are going on for a much longer period of time after, um, after birth. And then finally, there is a phase of repair and regeneration, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, um, which again goes on for an uncertain length of time, but probably extending several weeks and, and probably months and possibly even years, and which gives also the potential for uh, intervention. But as yet, um, there's very limited uh, both experimental and clinical data to show that we can um, significantly alter repair processes at this stage. So the hypothesis of secondary energy failure has been critical for, our, for, for stimulating uh, attempts at reducing brain injury following resuscitation. And this is the concept that following the initial insult, cerebral metabolism as measured by magnetic resonance spectroscopy is normal. This is the um, lower limit for the energy phosphates in the brain. And then falls in the subsequent 48 to 72 hours. Um, in babies who's, who go on um, subsequently to develop um, brain injury. In those infants who survive, uh, energy metabolism re recovers back to normal. So this gave rise to the concept of a latent period when perhaps neuroprotective interventions could be instigated and to prevent the occurrence of delayed cell death. And this, um, what was then a hypothesis, has been proven repeatedly now in experimental studies where this sequence of events has been reproduced um, uh, constantly or frequently um, in experimental models of hypoxia ischemia. And of course, this is the work that drove the uh, experimental and then clinical work for hypothermia. And this just shows in this one study by Marian Torres and others from uh, University College Hospital and in Oslo and, in, and Bristol, showing that in this study, just 12 hours of cooling prevented the secondary fall in energy phosphates, high energy phosphates, um, in babies treated with hypothermia. So that high energy phosphate levels were similar to the control, non-asphyxiated animals, um, when cooling was instigated from resuscitation for 12 hours. And um, as you know now, it is standard care in most countries to um, attempt to start cooling within six hours of birth and to provide prolonged cooling down to a um, reducing um, brain temperature by three to four degrees Celsius for 72 hours in babies who've suffered significant, at least moderate or severe um, asphyxia. So in terms of developing additional strategies or additional um, therapies, 
it is important to try and understand some of the mechanisms involved in this process of secondary energy failure. And it does look like, unfortunately, there is almost a perfect storm of abnormal um, events, biochemical and um, biological events, following hypoxia ischemia and during um, reperfusion. And I've listed some of these over here, and um, there isn't the time to go into any detail over here, but there is a very good review that you could look up, which we'll go into this in more, in more detail. But it does look that um, excitotoxicity or the accumulation of excitatory um, neurotransmitters is very, very important in the, um, in the etiology of brain injury following reperfusion. These um, uh, amino acids uh, accumulate during the asphyxia, but they're also accumulated to even higher levels in the reperfusion phase because of failure of transport of these um, um, uh, um, uh, molecules. And the, um, their action is on two main receptors, the NMDA receptor and the AMPA receptors. And excessive activity at these receptors by these um, excitatory agents will result in impaired calcium regulation. And calcium is a critical um, secondary messenger um, and uh, change and its concentration intracellularly is very, very closely controlled. The level within cells of calcium is about 10,000 times lower than it is in extracellular spa um, space. So any disruption in the control of intracellular calcium is uh, very damaging to cells. And um, the end result of these processes is is primarily mitochondrial injury. And mitochondrial injury will then result in any secondary energy failure and also precipitate um, apoptotic mechanisms, um, which um, result in a, a prolonged uh, uh, um, phase of uh, cell death. At each of these stages, it is possible to, um, to provide, oops, To, to, um, to, to develop compounds which might block um, one or more of these um, processes. The exact mechanism of hypothermia is uncertain, but it is presumed that it acts on many of these processes, and any potentially new effective therapies are likely to need to work at, mo at more than one stage in this pathophysiological cascade. It is worthwhile mentioning rea re um, uh, reactive oxygen species, particularly following um, Ola Sarkstad talk. Um, Ola has always castigated me for not having measured a FiO2 during resuscitation in our cooling studies. Our cooling studies were um, started in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and at that stage there was a wide variety of practice, and it was often the actual FiO2 used during resuscitation and the duration of oxygen therapy was often not monitored uh, very carefully. So it remains uncertain whether changes in FiO2 um, during resuscitation influenced the results of the cooling studies. However, since these were um, large randomized controlled styles, one would hope that oxygen would, the FiO2 at birth did not materially affect the results. But we do know that um, re -oxygen, reactive oxygen species are formed during resuscitation, particularly if oxygen um, um, is provided during birth, particularly the formation of the superoxide radical, which by itself is not very deleterious, but when combined with, uh, with ferric ions, will result in the hydroxyl radical, which is very, very damaging, has very toxic effects on DNA. And abnormality in calcium regulation intracellularly will result in the formation of hydroxyl radicals, which will cause further injury. We know that levels of nitric oxide also increase, and these can result in um, the development of peroxynitrite, which is um, also a very damaging molecule, particularly mitochondrial injury can occur following the um, occurrence of peroxynitrite. So it's likely that reoxidative oxygen species are involved in the pathophysiological processes um, during reperfusion. And there are compounds which can be used to try and reduce this, either um, agents such as allopurinol, which is an exantine oxidase um, inhibitor, or um, using free radical scavengers. So that is one target we can try, firstly by limiting oxygen exposure, um, particularly during resuscitation and in the reperfusion phase, 
and also by using compounds to try and prevent um, formation of these species. Some of these compounds are listed here. So we can use lipid peroxidation inhibitors, and we can use xanthine oxidase inhibitors, particularly allopurinol, oxypurinol. And we can try and prevent um, the deleterious effect of iron by using deferioxamine, as well as using uh, natural antioxidants such as melatonin and uh, other compounds. And the number of experimental studies have been done looking at these compounds, showing improvement in neurological injury uh, with these approaches. Um, so far, clinical studies have been very few and have not been conclusive. And, but this is an area of ongoing research, and particularly melatonin, studies using melatonin, um, mainly using pharmacological doses of, pharma, of melatonin, uh, um, tenfold or hundredfold higher than physiological doses of melatonin, are in progress. The role of inflammation is also very important following hypoxia ischemia. We know that the pro-inflammatory phase follows hypoxia ischemia, and if you measure cytokine levels, you will see that they are at their highest levels 24 to 48 hours um, following BERT. And um, experimentally, a reduction in this inflammatory cytokines does seem to reduce um, injury. Um, but this is a, a very complex area, and there is a balance of pro and anti-inflammatory um, cytokines um, in, uh, after asphyxia. And the exact ratio of this balance is uncertain. Mechanisms are currently poorly understood. And it is, one needs to be careful um, uh, in, this, in this area because some of the cytokines which are normally protective, anti-inflammatory, such as IL-10, can actually be deleterious experimentally when given following asphyxia. So this is an area which, again, is an area of active research. But currently, there is very limited data to to allow us to, to know how to proceed um, um, at this stage. The other interesting concept is about expanding the therapeutic window. You saw in the earlier slides that, we, that there appears to be a therapeutic window of up to maybe 24 hours before secondary, secondary energy failure occurs, where we might intervene to, pre to prevent that energy failure. And we know that um, hypothermia at least based on experimental studies, appears to extend this therapeutic window, allowing um, the opportunity to add additional compounds, additional therapies to, um, to, to improve outcome. And most of the current studies of additional therapies are relying on this ability of hypothermia to extend the, um, uh, the therapeutic window um, to allow the additional, additional therapies to be given even up to 12 or 24 hours after birth. But there might be other therapies which might also extend this therapeutic window. And experimentally, again, anticonvulsant therapies, particularly topiramate and also now phenobarbitone, does appear to extend the therapeutic window. So that, for example, when hypothermia is delayed beyond the six hours, that's currently the standard for starting hypothermia, it remains effective if, if um, these anticonvulsant therapies are given uh, very early on. So I think this is another area of work where, the, where clinical studies are needed to try and define the exact uh, timing of giving these therapies. In terms of enhancing repair, um, there's interesting data about the role of macrophages. And um, macrophages generally are thought to be injurious um, substances. But actually, um, the so-called M2 state of macrophages is thought to be reparative. And there are um, attempts to develop compounds which will stimulate this phase of macrophages, which will help um, brain repair. We know that many of these gro important growth factors are, um, are present in, 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 uh, in the newborn. And upregulating these growth factors or addition giving additional growth factors might be um, uh, reparative. But so far, there have been no um, uh, clinical studies to show a benefit using these growth factors, apart from perhaps erythropoietin, EPO, which I shall mention um, uh, briefly. But there are things like, such as ampokines and melatonin, again, which can act as growth factors, which might be important in the reparative phase um, following, brain, following asphyxia. One of the problems with some of these growth factors is they have to be delivered to the target, so have to be given intraventricularly, 
and that obviously um, uh, is a limiting factor in using these compounds. There's been one clinical, um, sorry, the other thing is using of stem cells, which is very topical at the moment, and certainly experimentally, uh, neural stem cells appear to be able to reduce lesion size in, in, uh, in experimental models, and mesenchymal stem cells, which are much more likely to be used in clinical practice, um, are showing improved neurological function in experimental models. And currently, that early phase trial is, is being carried out. Um, and so until this clinical data is available, there's currently no real indication for giving stem cells to newborn babies. I did mention that there is one clinical study which has looked at the use of erythropoietin um, in babies with um, hypoxic encephalopathy. But this, this study did not combine erythropoietin with cooling, and we await the results of other studies which are in plan and ongoing, looking at the combined use of erythropoietin and hypothermia. But in the study, erythropoietin, even delayed um, 24 hours after birth, was able to show um, an improvement in disability or in death or disability in babies treated with, with, um, with erythropoietin. And interesting, in the study, erythropoietin was given um, repeatedly for up to two weeks after birth. And so it may well be that our intervention uh, for neuroprotection may need to extend beyond the first few hours after birth to several weeks later. We need to be aware that there are many failed neuroprotective therapies, and certainly in the adult um, literature, um, the majority of uh, attempted potential and um, putative neuroprotective therapies have failed. Um, in prior to hypothermia, studies looked at calcium channel blockers, phenobarbital, magnesium sulfate, and allopurinol as uh, attempts for neuroprotection. Some of these studies failed because of um, adverse effects of the uh, compound. Um, others mainly failed for logistical reasons. And one of the biggest challenges we have with uh, neuroprotection studies is that most of these trials are carried out in countries where the incidence of moderate severe asphyxial encephalopathy is actually quite uncommon maybe not, um, half to one per thousand births. So you need large trials, you need multi-center trials, and these are expensive and, and difficult and take a long time to carry out. So although these compounds may be promising, such as magnesium sulfate and allopurinol, so far there have been only small clinical trials, and um, in general they have failed to conclusively show whether they are of any uh, benefit. And this problem, as I said, is a, a, a constant problem facing studies of neuroprotection, that there are many, many compounds and many um, uh, targets that we could target that um, appear to be effective in experimental studies, but, appear and, but then are difficult to show benefit in clinical studies. And there is a, a need to change our focus from doing um, uh, just several randomized controlled trials, but to just focusing on compounds which have been shown um, to have a robust evidence base behind them before going on to randomized clinical trials. And in the adult literature, um, there are recommendations on how one, one ought to develop what should be the developmental pathway for new therapies. And these um, primarily um, rely on the use of biomarkers for uh, informing us in choosing the most robust, um, likely neuroprotective therapy. And in our group, we have focused on using imaging as a biomarker, um, first by showing that these biomarkers can be qualified against meaningful outcomes, and, um, and then using these biomarkers in uh, babies following asphyxia to see if we can um, demonstrate um, evidence of efficacy in potential new therapies. One of these um, imaging biomarkers is magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and here we're using proton spectroscopy to measure brain anastale aspartate, or cerebral lactate, shown as a doublet negative peak over there. And the uh, concentration of these compounds in the brain correlates very well with the severity of injury and with subsequent outcome. Mm -hmm. 
and the sensitivity and specificity of using the ratio of lactate to an aspartate um, is, is high, although it has wide confidence intervals, and does not seem to be affected by the age at which you measure these compounds. So this is a non-invasive way that we can measure a marker of brain injury which correlates with outcome. Increasingly, we're using a more sophisticated method for looking at changes in the microstructure of the brain by looking at changes in what is called the ionisotropy or fractional ionisotropy in white matter tracts. And um, we are also looking at changes in the resting state with functional MRI and looking at how these are altered following asphyxia and how they might be effective by, affected by neuroprotective therapies. There are techniques now such as one called track bait spatial statistics or TBSS, which allows you to combine the data from several babies and combine the, um, the, 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 the data from all the voxels that you image in these scans to do group-wise analysis of uh, measures of white matter injury um, measuring fraction and anisotropy. And you can color code these changes, so areas which have statistically significant differences in fractional anisotropy can be color coded, and you can see that there are changes, in, shown in blue here, in the white matter tracts between cooled and non-cooled babies following hypoxia ischemia. And we're able to observe these changes in just very small numbers. These are just the babies that had been randomized to cooling or non-cooling in our center um, um, in the Toby study. And subsequently, um, not showing data here, we're able to show these changes um, um, correlated with neurological outcome so that babies who had um, a, a better outcome had preserved fractional anisotropy in their white matter tracts. And the beauty of these biomarkers is that it allows you to see significant, statistically significant changes in relatively small numbers of cases. And um, um, it, you can calculate that for a 5% change in F fractional anisotropy in white matter tracts, you need a, a, a sample size of around uh, 50 babies. Um, and that's uh, eminently doable in a relatively um, two or three centers a st a small study. If you relied on the standard techniques, then you tend to need very much larger numbers of babies. I'm gonna finish by talking about xenon because um, every group that is interested in neuroprotection has to focus on one area and try to study that, that agent um, in detail um, rather than uh, trying to carry out many different uh, uh, therapies. We have chosen xenon because there is quite now a, an established experimental base showing that xenon has profound cerebral effects and that it can be neuroprotective. It is a trace gas present in the atmosphere. Um, it is a rare gas and therefore it is an expensive gas. Um, it is uh, um, an aesthetic gas and um, has been used an, as an anesthesia primarily in patients who are too sick to, to tolerate standard anesthetics and has been shown to be neuroprotectant in animal models. It rapidly enters the brain. Its uh, fraction of equilibration is very high and very rapid so that you know that with xenon it will enter the brain within before one minute after administration. And this is a huge advantage because with many other compounds, for example, erythropoietin, we really don't know what, how quickly um, the compound enters the brain and what the brain levels are. Whereas with xenon, you know that you are achieving the inhaled concentration um, fully into the brain. We know it is a potent NMDA receptor. The seminal work carried out by Nick Franks at Imperial showed that the anesthetic properties of xenon are related to its NMDA receptor blockage uh, activity. And um, experimentally has been shown to reduce the um, infarct that you get um, with uh, severe hypoxia following in the rise of Nucci model of, uh, of asphyxia um, with 70% xenon completely abolished as that infarcted area. And other studies show that even lower concentrations of xenon given for slightly longer period can prevent um, cerebral injury following asphyxia. This is the um, 
data from the Torsen group showing a reduction in the um, uh, 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 neuropathology score in animals treated with 50% xenon for three hours um, after asphyxia. And recently, our collaborators at UCL have shown using magnetic resonance spectroscopy that the combination of xenon and cooling here completely abolished the rise in lactate. Um, uh, this is the lactate over creatinine ratios uh, in animals, in piglets here, um, who were, um, suffered asphyxia. So that although um, hypothermia and xenon partially protected the brain, the combination of the two was synergistic. So this has drove us to, um, to develop, uh, to, to explore the possibility of using xenon as a clinical um, agent for neuroprotection. So the first challenge was to, dev to devise a ventilator that enabled us to provide uh, xenon to babies. As I said, xenon is a very expensive gas, costs about $40 a liter um, uh, at the moment, and therefore has to be recycled. And so we had to develop a, re a recirculating ventilator that can be used by neonatologists. Clearly, we could have used an anesthetic machine, but that would require an anesthetist to be uh, present by the baby. So we developed a ventilator to, um, to do that, and then embarked on a, st a, sm on a, a early phase a randomized trial of 24 hours of 30% inhaled xenon um, in a group of 130 babies. And we did this using um, uh, uh, magnetic resonance biomarkers as our primary outcome measure, mainly using changes in fractional anisotropy or changes in the lactate of NAA ratio on spectroscopy. To be able to do that, we had to standardize our magnetic resonance imaging protocol, and we had to use um, MRI scanners which had um, similar hardware and similar operating systems. And therefore, we limited our study to just three sites. Currently, we've added a, a fourth center. And um, we've spent the last two or three years developing our ventilator. This is our um, uh, outline, where we identify babies as we did for the cooling studies. We obtain parental consent. We randomize. And the babies are randomized to either standard care with cooling or standard care with um, cooling plus xenon. And then um, we do an MRI scan within uh, 15 days and follow them up subsequently. So our ventilator model uses a, a chamber through which the gas is recirculated inside this anesthetic bag or bellow. And inside the sealed chamber, which is connected to your neonatal ventilator, this bellow can be compressed using driven by the ventilator so that gas is recirculated around the baby. And this is um, completely, this process is completely automated using microprocessor control. And in our um, preliminary experience, in the first few babies, so far we have studied 26 infants. And in our preliminary experience, we have shown that, um, that, the, um, that the vital signs remain unchanged during 30% um, xenon inhalation and that gas usage is quite low, about 20 mils per minute, uh, of which 30% is comprised of xenon. So we can calculate that the gas, that the cost of giving this therapy over 24 hours would equate to between 600 and $1,000. Professor Azubardi, you have uh, two minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm coming to the end. I think this is my final slide, in fact. Um, and clearly, this is very, very early days, but um, we plan to continue with um, uh, the study. The, pr the first interim analysis will be carried out when we've reached uh, a number of 60 babies, because based on our modeling of um, the power based on using, uh, looking for changes in fractional anisotropy, uh, a number of 50 or 60 babies should be sufficient to show some changes in uh, fractional isotropy in white matter tracts. But the other intriguing finding about observations so far about xenon, this obviously is not reported, is that we have observed in some of our babies um, a apparently strong anticonvulsant property of xenon in our babies with some rebound seizures in babies 
who, when the xenon is, is being stopped. And this is just one baby showing how when xenon is stopped, within uh, a few minutes, seizures recurred, which required then treatment with uh, phenytoin. And certainly, we seem anecdotally to observe quite a, a strong anticonvulsant effect of this therapy, which is not surprising given and, and is consistent with, our, um, with the experimental data suggesting that xenon is a potent and MDA blocker. So I will stop uh, at this stage. So I hope in this very brief overview I've uh, shown you that, um, um, that there are a number of pathophysiological processes and mechanisms involved in the phase after resuscitation. These offer a number of targets that we can uh, attempt to, um, uh, at which we can intervene. And there are many potential therapies that might be explored. Um, the challenge that faces us is to how to efficiently uh, examine these therapies so that we can translate some of these um, therapies into clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.